Hello everyone, I welcome all of you who has just joined us. This is the Media Center Ukraine in Ukraine Forum and today we've prepared for you a special event today and now we understand that the informational war has become a kind of a full-scale front line where a separate type of uh, troops is working. So today we will be speaking about Russian propaganda, how it should be found out and discovered, how we can fight it. And we have Ukrainian journalists coming to speak with us who are working with this phenomenon for a ninth year already since the beginning of the war. So in a nutshell about our timing, about the organizational issues, our timing is 45 minutes. We will be speaking in Ukrainian, so whatever if you need interpretation we have simultaneous interpretation which you can use and our event will be started by Yuri Makarov editor-in-chief of the uh, public broadcasting company of Ukraine board hello dear colleagues everybody who knows Ukrainian media community you should know that it's not that easy for us to unite Within our community, we are quarreling a lot, we are competing with each other, we accuse each other of betrayal and betrayal again, but today, this is the moment and the reason for the sake of which the Ukrainian journalists, not only the ones who are present here, have united because we are speaking not only about the danger, lethal danger for our country, but also, specifically, the type of weapons which will be used by this country. This is the day of mourning and um, memory of victims of war of Ukraine. So when we speak about those who have to be blamed for this war. Mostly people remember about Nuremberg court trial. And we cannot wait enough. Of course, we will wait enough for another Nuremberg, for those who has waged this war, for those who we are totally, with all the reasons, calling fascists. According to any politological, political, scientific definitions and characteristics, they are correspondent to this notion. The people who do not want for the Ukrainians to exist, just for us not to be here. Because we are some wrong kind of people. And besides that, in this war, there is a separate type of troops that is informational saboteurs. Anywhere and everywhere where we can see Russian weapons, we can also see the fighters of this very visible front line. They are cooperating and collaborating with the Russian special services. They are directly accomplishing and uh, doing what they command. They also rather often are in the staff of the Russian special services, are employed by them, or they are freelancers but again, again under the direct control. So when they disseminate all of those slogans about Ukrainian Nazi this is not the first year when it happens. We understand that this is also a part of that genocide which is developing against Ukrainians. We know several examples when propagandists who can be accused of these crimes were prosecuted and called to account beginning with uh, Dr. Goebbels in the World War II and Julius Streicher. But those were some of the, well, besides the bigger Nuremberg trial, there were smaller trials and courts, court proceedings in the jurisdiction of the Federative Republic of Germany. 
even against the occupational administration. We know that also the ones who waged this genocide were prosecuted as well, in particular the Radio 1000 Hills. And we'd like to begin at least at this symbolic level would like to push the real court to take place, registering and documenting the crimes of Russian propaganda and collection of materials for the further liability and prosecution, criminal prosecution for the crimes against humanity of really very specific Russian propagandists, name by name, patronymic by patronymic and surname by surname. So from here, from Ukraine Forum, we urge to the whole democratic world, to all of our colleagues, please join this fight together with us, because they are not our colleagues. They have a different aim. They have different values. They have different standards. So their standards is their military mission. They are not colleagues for us. This is not press. This is not media. When a Russian journalist is in the frame and it is written on his armored vest press it's not press really this is just a usual fake journalist and i think that well maybe it's weird for me why this question wasn't posed before but maybe it never occurred to anybody that i'm happy that those who are here at this meeting that we finally found time for this as well. Because this, if you remember, in the Holy Bible, uh, the ones who were, uh, in fact, seducing, they will feel the grief. So they should feel the grief in The Hague or any other court, but in the court with a very clear and precise verdict which would be a lesson not only for this awful territory which is in the direction of the east from us but for the whole world so please join and let's give the floor to our speakers Viktor Trihubov please this is the expert on strategic communications hello well, we know more or less how Russian departments of informational counteraction are working. We know that just because uh, the Ukrainian military is where prisoner, uh, we're taking them as prisoners of war, and we know what's their structure, how the units are working directly, which are dealing with informational operations in the Russian army. I will tell you instantly, they're working bad. They really have a Soviet structure. Those are the guys who are sitting and at the special device, Rizograph, they are disseminating leaflets how it's nice to live in the Soviet Union. It's not efficient and it has never been efficient. The only efficient thing what their troops are doing is dissemination of different inject informations in the Telegram channels, Viber chats, where the people are with a very low I would say level of criticality, like uh, domestic Viber chats or city ones, which just visited of the people who are not that very sophisticated. So it cannot be compared with the units of the informational psychological operations at all. Uh, but there is always a but. If we're speaking directly about the military propaganda, about the military and the servicemen who are dealing with the military operations, the problem is that in Russian operation, this is not only the mission of the special services and the military, but of everybody. Russia is totalitarian society, and this totalitarian society, everything is weaponized. Everything, whatever you can see, is used uh, for the achievement of the Russian foreign policy aims. And here we're speaking about the so-called journalists, uh, like Margarita Simonyan, like Stashov Kotz. Those people, in fact, 
are the officers of different special services and the journalists who don't have those ranks but they're working as if they are for instance coming back to Solovyov as an example they are all the unified system they are all one and big special service in spite of whether they have the formal status of a journalist or not they are all the producers of propaganda and the ones who don't have the rank mostly are producing this propaganda even more efficiently, better and with better, more experience. It is an issue. But in fact, there are good news as well. If you have observed, well, I don't know, as I have observed that during the recent years, you could notice that the quality of Russian propaganda in the world and its efficiency has significantly decreased. Uh, lately, they've requalified and they've decided to work on the third world. They are not relevant for the European Union, for example, or in the United States. So they began to work in Africa, India, and it can bring to some results, in fact, because if you look um, at the comments about any news uh, about Ukraine in New York Times or any other foreign uh, publishing office, you will see lots of pro-Russian Africans. Not because they bought the network of African um, bots and trolls, but uh, because they used to work with the Europeans, now they work with the Africans. Because the fact the level and the quality of propaganda is really decreased and now it is much better for the uh, non-critical audience. The Europeans are not like that anymore. The main explanation is propaganda is like culture, like music for instance if in your country you don't have the musical market you don't have the people who listen to different musical bands then whatever money you invest as a state it won't be efficient why sweden has lots of bands of hard metal and rock because they like to listen to that if russia would like to become cooler than sweden and invested billions it wouldn't become because the russian people are not listening to this type of music they don't have competition the same is about propaganda if if you, you just made your own society so stupid during so many years, its critical thinking decreased to the level of the dogs, then you cannot provide and manufacture efficient propaganda for the uh, beyond. You won't have internal competition. You will get used to focus on the dog and you will produce the same level of content, the content at least of the level of the non-critical layers of society. And another point is that Russia does not have now any informational image which it could offer for other countries. Even in Ukraine, when they are trying to impact with propaganda, why it's not working? But what are they offering at the occupied territories, the territories that you, which they are now going to occupy? They even complain themselves that Ukraine is showing something beautiful. It says, you will have European future. We will construct a nice European country with a nice level of welfare. We will change the lives for the better. But what does Russia say? Well, we will destroy a street, but it won't be renamed. It will stay the level of the 19th party meeting and uh, no one will ban celebration of the new year though no one banned it before so it's not working the russia doesn't have a vision of the future which it can offer for the world it cannot just say that we are le leading the world to the bright future of communism even this russia conservatism which we, uh, they were trying to show is not efficient anymore at least in the countries of the west so the efficiency of Russian propaganda decreased and that is why they are now focused mostly on the layers of the non-critical thinking like the same countries because of the lack of the developed system of media and for, in case of Ukraine, for very specific media who mostly are read with the people of the low level of critical thinking like the home Viber chats because to this or that extent, it's not that a very reliable media. So, in fact, now, Russian Federation in the information war, uh, according to my persuasion, is losing. So, now, in spite of all incredible money they have invested into the creation of their communications in the EU and the US, all of that has been broken. It, they, do, they are not loved even in Greece. Uh, they've lost their potential in the religious field, in the cultural field, in the diplomatic field, and in fact in the media field as well. And it is very visible and obvious, which saves our lives a bit. So we need to work uh, 
to go on with, like this. But we have lots of points to explain to the Europeans. For instance, I explained to the Europeans, the Americans, and even the Arabs why I will never take part in the common programs with Russians. Because any participants with the common programs with Ru Russians who are a weaponized society makes me at the same level with them. If they are weaponized non-journalists, I will have to become a weaponized non-journalist. And it's not the right thing to be. I would not like to be equal with them. I would not like our us to be perceived in the same way by the Americans, Europeans or Arabs. We need to explain a lot to Germans, to French, to the Hungarians. But it's a nice task and it is accomplishing, accomplishable. Thank you for your attention. Ruslan Denichenko, Executive Director of Stop Fake. Ruslan, what is happening with fakes? There is such a feeling that here they are not perceived and are not that efficient among our audience how it used to be in 2014 when we saw that it was working unfortunately what's happening now well first and foremost nothing has changed they are produced and even more uh, than they used to be stop fake is dealing with monitoring disinformation not only fakes but disinformation as well first and foremost in the russian media for more than eight years beginning with march 2014 uh, though during these times we've heard from multiple times criticism why we should do that it's not efficient to debunk every fake or vice versa you're helping to disseminate it even people do not believe in that but look now we are saying that the people who have produced those lots of fakes, who were dealing with disinformation, produced it, created this informational propaganda machine, that they need to be responsible. It is already becoming a mainstream in Ukraine. We have consensus about that. And I would say that in Europe and the US are coming close to that as well. That this is also the war crime not only of the reporters like Mr. Kotz or Slatkov who have to be responsible, but also those who have been in the comfortable Moscow offices, in St. Petersburg offices as well, and created content, in particular Ms. Ovsyannikova. Those people need to be responsible because for about almost 10 years they've waged this war. So, again, when we are saying that during these times what Stopfike did, we did not only monitor, we busted those fakes and debunked them. We collected a huge collection, many thousands of fakes which we debunked, but now all of those fakes uh, are, and our debunking is transformed into the evidence base. Lavrov and other Russian state officials will repeat when they will be asked where are the proofs, we can show those proofs. We've collected them during those eight years even more than eight years we can for each russian media for each journalist we can provide the proofs what and when uh, he or she was lying and how which uh, reports they shot so i will open a secret we are finalizing a huge database where all of that will be collected all of this information during these eight years and when we invented this idea we wanted just to, to have convenient use of this information for the researchers but now we can see that uh, the day is coming when this information will be used by the investigators who will analyze all of that and also present it in the real courts against real uh, convicts who will get real punishment for what they've done and one more moment which i'd like to mention is about the efficiency when well we are not just collecting the fakes and debunking them together with the company of facebook our organization is marking labeling those fakes when they emerge in facebook so when someone is injecting disinformation into facebook he or she gets the message notification and gets to know that it's wrong and why it's not true he or she can read so in comparison with some of other platforms who just can delete this information and by the way it's not always useful because now we can see that lots of disinformation for 2014, 15 and 16 is just deleted from YouTube. And again, we are working to save that in the archives, but it's also the evidence base and it's important to preserve it. So again, uh, 
I cannot just tell you the figures, but monthly millions of posts are labeled. Millions of people get to know that this or that piece of information is not true and why it's not true. So it seems to us it's one of the reasons why Facebook, uh, that is company of Meta, uh, has announced, has not only been banned, but announced as extremists. Because it's even more efficient than the approach when this information is just deleted. So I do hope that the efforts which Ukrainian journalist community is doing, they are making this day closer than when the ones who produced all of these years, um, during all of these years, disinformation, they will get fair punishment. Thank you. Maxim Vikrov, uh, editor-in-chief of the magazine Ukrainian Week. Hello. I fully agree with what was mentioned by my colleagues before, but also I'd like to emphasize one more point. When I, together with my colleagues in Ukrainian Week, we are working with the foreign audiences, we are communicating with the foreign journalists. In fact, it's those are, can be different countries. It could be France, it could be India. So we are facing rather often with the the deficit of understanding of that Russian journalists are not journalists at all. So on the one hand, everybody in the world knows that there is Russian propaganda, that it's really toxic, it's massive, it's bold, but we are fully facing the situations when some kind of normal media just refers to Russian sources, cites Russian speakers, reporters, and so on. So out of that, we can get a very important strategic task. Ukraine as a state and the journalist community of Ukraine has to let the world know a very simple message. Everything what's done by Ukrainian journalists, bloggers, opinion leaders and so on, well, he meant Russian journalists, is propaganda. It's not journalism. Even if it's written press, press on their chest, even if they represent uh, some media, they look like journalists, they behave like journalists, but they are still soldiers of the information war, which is conducted against Ukraine. And the thing is not only to for the international community to acknowledge and understand that those people are the source of fakes or the performers of some informational psychological operations. Those people are the also the ones who commit the attack against Ukraine. They also are the co-participants of the crimes which the Russian army is committing in Ukraine, they always also take part in the genocides and in the crimes against humanity which cannot be expired. So out of this we have the second strategic task which is no less important and maybe even more important. Those people need to be called to account and prosecuted. As it was already mentioned by Mr. Makarov, we know examples when the heads of Radio 1000 Hills in Uganda or the editor of the German Der Stürmer faced the court trial and were punished. And we need together with our common efforts as a journalist community, as other institutions on the Ukrainian state and the international community, we need to have this success again. And with these facial expressions they need to sit in the court, those Russian propagandists whose names we need, as professionals, we need to know and to write where it should be written down. So, our mission as Ukrainian journalists is not only to debunk or bust the fakes, not only to stop and suspend psychological operations, informational psychological operations, but to do whatever is um, depends on us for such kind of event to take place again. Denis Kazansky, Ukrainian journalist. Denis used to work at Donetsk region in the beginning of the war, and he had to leave its territory because of the temporary occupation. Denis, you have uh, to be one of the first who faced the outcomes of propaganda. Maybe you could share some cases. Yes, that's true. 
Well, I don't think that I will tell you something new now, because on the screen we have seen the quotes from different publications of the Russian so-called journalists, so-called military reporters. Mostly, those, this is not journalism about making people aware what's happening. Those are just um, appeals, appeals to murder, and the journalist cannot appeal to the verdicts. The journalist makes people aware, but those journalists intimidate. They call for killings and dehumanize the society. Their work, according to its essence, is really different from what is mostly done by the journalists. We can see, for instance, some of the fresh examples, like the Russian military reporter who is working in Mariupol, Alexander Slatkov. He wrote that just look at Mariupol. If the city does not surrender, it will be destroyed, and the same fate is awaiting for Kharkiv and other Ukrainian cities. That's definitely not journalism. Those are just calls for mass murders. And moreover, what we can see since the beginning of the war in 2014 witnesses that Russia Russia just perceives all of those military reporters as soldiers in this war. They also accomplish some missions and tasks. They are also the part of the army. So, according to the foreign journalists and Ukrainian journalists, Russians have the same attitude towards them. They also perceive the journalists from other countries as the soldiers of the enemy's army who have to be killed or at least uh, you have to use violation against uh, them violence against them. And just today we saw the report of the organization's Reporters Without Borders. I think that you know this organization. So we made the conclusion about the killing of the Ukrainian journalist and photographer Max Levin, who was killed in March in Kyiv region, close to Kyiv. There were different versions that he got under shelling and uh, perished, but today we saw the report which proves that he was tortured and killed, executed by Russian m servicemen. So they made it targetedly and executed him. And there were also other cases when the journalists died, including the foreign ones and Ukrainian ones, and uh, it witnesses that Russia is killing them targetedly. The Russian army, the Russians are killing journalists because they consider uh, that the foreign journalists are at war against them, which means that any measures, any restrictions who are, which are used against Russian media, so-called Russian press, is also totally excused. It is reasonable. When the Russian, Russia intentionally kills journalists but claims their media to work freely all over the world, it's a very cynical and vile position which cannot be taken into account. In any case, the Russian media, which bear death, urging and uh, appealing for, calling for military war crimes and violence, they should be restricted. And we can see this process, and it's a good one. And any appeals for democracy in this case cannot be working because Russian journalists are the ones who are calling for murders. They are not doing journalism. We can see that in the Baltic countries there are certain restrictions of the work of Russian TV channels and the same happens in Europe about Russia today. It's a totally right thing to do and as it was mentioned already we really should see the criminal responsibility and liability at least against those representatives of Russian media who were calling directly for mass murders and destroying of Ukraine. And the quotes, which you could see on the screen, uh, confirm that. Those are Russian military reporters, first and foremost, Stieshin, Kots, Slatkov, whom I mentioned before. Uh, they have to be called to account and criminally prosecuted. And if, if it's important to take them under arrest now, to take them to the court, uh, it shouldn't stop anybody, because now we have the process ongoing in the Netherlands on on the shot down MH17 Boeing, and they are now uh, dealing with the people who are hiding in Russia. Of course, the court is still ongoing. The same about these military reporters. They need to know that uh, there is a court, there will be some verdict, and they will never be able to leave Russia, or maybe even they will be extradited for punishment. So these people cannot just deal 
with waging the war and violence with the calls for murders and feel total well uh, that they won't be punished just being covered with the journalists um, documents i am a journalist and i can write whatever i want nothing will happen to me it shouldn't be like that with those russian propagandists that is why i'd like to urge you First of all, our Ukrainian authorities and also foreign community as well, international community, do not neglect that, do not neglect those factors, and you should also deal with this fear. I know that uh, now the platforms and commissions on investigation of war crimes are being created on calling to account of Russian war criminals, and those propagandists shouldn't be forgotten about. Uh, they should be in this process and should be called to account as well. I thank you. I know that you've prepared a video which you'd like to show to our colleagues. So please, could you comment what we'll see now? I'm the editor of European Pravda, and I'm facing what the Russian so-called journalists are writing. I need to say it's not just not journalism, it's not just propaganda, it's the part of work of Russian services abroad. We've seen lots of examples like that, but the most demonstrative was the example when Russian so-called journalism was trying to excuse criminals in the UK. Do you remember the interview of Margarita Simonyan, as if she interrogated those FSB employees? So this is the symptom that this is not a journalism, this is the international crime, and those people should be punished in the international tribunal. I'm the journalist with more than 20 years of experience. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, uh, Suspilne, and now I'm in the armed forces of Ukraine. I'm mobilized. So we need to distinguish the notions of journalism and propaganda. What the workers of Russian state media are committing has nothing in common with journalism. It's a pure propaganda and propaganda of war and international violence, uh, calls to genocide, and the key characters of these TV and radio broadcasting companies and other media have to face the court as it was done with the employees of the official media of Nazi Germany, Volkische Faubachter or Deutsche Wokenschuhe, and the same happened after the investigation of genocide in Rwanda when the criminal cases were opened against the workers of the pro-governmental radio which called for genocide. All of that, I consider, after the failure of the Russian regiment should take place against the official Russian media. I call to my colleagues, journalists, join this media, uh, this and uh, sh record the same video. Hello, I'm Roman Skripin, I have my own media project, and I was called to join this initiative of the Ukrainian journalists who are united during these hard times. I hope uh, not before uh, the our death penalty, but it will be the proper verdict of the international um, court against Nazism, against Russian propagandists, because we need to finalize it. It's the issue of life and death 1.0. I have basic principles in my life. To be real, and it's a slogan of my project, also I think that every action has its own price. And this price can be very high for those who committed those actions both from the positive and negative side. Every sad word, according to my persuasion, has consequences. It's like a stone which is thrown into the water, and then you will see those circles on the water. Every, even slightest word, weighs something. And this weight is really well fate. Uh, if this word is a right one, is if it's an appropriate one. So I support and I urge my colleagues to support the initiative and to begin the process of registering and documentation of the crimes of Russian propagandists and call them to account. Because they are awaiting for Nuremberg, if we may say so, or our own Mariupol. So we appeal, I appeal to. In fact, I, I'm not signing collective letters and I'm not joining collective initiatives mostly because I'm, I'm used to be a warrior in my old field, but I support 
And I urge the whole democratic world and the journalists to join this fight with propagandists of Russian Nazi Russist regimen. And again, I will remind you, and I support the organizers, that it's not press, it's not media. They are trying to hide against this uh, rank. This is fake journalism, and they need to be punished. Together we will prevail. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the armed forces of Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. You have heard the appeals of our journalists. Let's come to the questions now. Please, if you've got any questions, would you raise your hand? Thank you for being out today. Uh, if one defines propaganda as the intention to manipulate public opinion toward political ends, how effective would you consider Russian propaganda in the United States? Is that of concern to you today? Does that keep you awake at night that U.S. public opinion will be altered by current efforts on Russia? Who would answer? Uh, for now, it's not such an effective as it was before, first of all. And secondary, you should understand that in a Russian case, it's indirect propaganda. They know to actually working for some for some political goal. They just work to make turmoil. They just work to make internal conflict. They just can support different uh, political powers, uh, social powers, uh, just to create social conflict. So in that particular case, uh, yes, Russia propaganda in the United States sometimes effective. When they need to, well, make one social uh, group attack another, they are effective, but that's not uh, classical political propaganda, like when you try to make someone, some your political puppet, some your political client uh, to go into power. That's not how it works there and, in, uh, well, today. That's just creating an internal conflict. The conflict in itself is a Russian ally in the United States, in Europe, in NATO, in European Union, and so. Are there any other questions? Victoria Nakonechno, Korean Forum. I've got a question about the future possible uh, court proceedings against Russian journalists, so-called journalists. Which steps we need to conduct for this process, for this court uh, proceeding to be possible? Should it be done against Russian propagandists, but also against the Western so-called journalists who are consciously cooperating with the aggressor? And uh, is it the separate process or the part of a big court procedure against Russia as an aggressor country? So please, colleagues, who is ready to answer? In my own opinion, when we are speaking about this court proceedings pro process, we need to distinguish the ones who are taking part in that and this litigation shouldn't be some kind of uh, just making people accused of something, but this should be a totally legitimate litigation with an evidence base and for people to be responsible for certain crimes. It's not easy for me to speak about the Western journalists, about the level, well, and who you mean, in fact. Maybe we need some examples. But why are we speaking about the Russians now? Because it's important to mention that all of those people we can see, we, we are speaking about, are the people who are working for Russian state. They're working in the Russian state media. They're getting salaries from the Russian state. So they are state officials who are doing whatever they do, because this is the state commission. And we can see and say precisely that Solovyov, Margarita Simonyan, Dmitry Kiselov, uh, they are the state officials. They are working at the state TV channels getting state funding. So uh, they waging the war and violence. They are working for the regimen of Putin. They are the parts of his regimen. If we are speaking about the journalists who are not working officially for the Russian state, their position can be just 
maybe the one which is mistaken, maybe they are mistaken, maybe, maybe they are sincere. It's not the fact that they are doing something commissioned. We cannot just put to trial anybody who said something against Ukraine or supported Russian perspective. We need to precisely and specifically speak about the people who were directly appealing to, gen uh, to genocide, to murdering of Ukrainian citizens, to war. We are showing you some of the quotations of the specific people and those quotations can be heard most of all from the Russian state officials. This is my opinion. We, there are some people, specific people, whose blame is obvious. I would add, when we are speaking about the Western journalists, most of all we are speaking, I do apologize for the notion, the ones who are working for Russian for Russia. We are speaking about, unfortunately, useful idiots or the people who have some personal bias. The classical example was yesterday. The journalist of BuzzFeed, Christopher Miller, a good person of pro-Ukrainian views, but he's really cycled to search Nazis. And this is the person who really wrote that Azov has Nazis, Azov has Nazis for several years in a row. And as a result, we know Azov was demonized. The international support was not sent to Azov because BuzzFeed wrote about that and it did not let Azov to be efficient countering uh, Russians during the combats. Is he a pro-Russian agent? Of course he's not. He's pro-Ukrainian. He's sincerely pro-Ukrainian. But uh, can the actions of this person, maybe someone was even killed because of him? Yes. I would say that someone could be killed because of him. But he's not an agent, but there are reputational losses. So when one Ukrainian journalist came to and announced that he's coming to the informational panel discussion together with him, she was commented by her own subscribers in Facebook. Because this is how reputation works. But what again we need to remember, there are Ukrainian journalists, some of the Ukrainian journalists who were not working for Russian Federation, but for different scum, like Klimenko, like uh, oppositional political faction, Shari party and others. So we need to think what we can do with them, especially under the condition that some of them are now the hosts of the national TV marathon. Thank you. There is one more question. Hello, Andriy Shevchenko, Media Center. Ukraine. In the fresh report, the bulletin of Eurasia Group, the organization which uh, has the headquarters in Washington, they say that the Russian propaganda is activated in some of the Eastern European countries, neighboring countries, Bulgaria, Romania and Slovakia. And they even foresee that it can lead to the colder position of these countries against Ukraine. I would like to ask which countries and which regions uh, does Russian propaganda focus upon, if there are some? And uh, is it possible that it's not substantial to be afraid of that? Please. Well, re it really is, but as I already mentioned, the more countries has used to the Russian propaganda system of media, the less developed media market is, then it's more vulnerable against Russian propaganda, and the more active Russian propaganda is there. Yes, obviously, Bulgaria has a bit worse situation in comparison with, let's say, Sweden. So, yes, Russian propaganda is trying to target the countries where they have some of the pan-Slavic sentiments. That's true. Slavic sentiments. Yes, they target always targeted the countries of ex-Yugoslavia. They like to work at the Balkans. As for Slovakia, it's not that efficient, because Slovakia is a very specific region. Uh, my friends and colleagues are working there, and on the one hand, they are very neutral, but they are very cautious. They're neutral. They look like Belarus about their mentality. They try not to be interfering in the conflicts and they try not to take sides. Though they have pro-Ukrainian sentiments because they can see that the Ukrainians are suffering, they pity us. But on the other hand, uh, there is certain vulnerability against pro-Russian narratives. As the Russians say, we don't know the whole truth. The truth is somewhere in the middle. That is why they really 
sometimes can perceive Russian propaganda, though it's not that bad in Slovakia than in the above-mentioned Bulgaria and Romania. Yes, I'd like to add, and I fully agree about the countries which you listed, we had to open our Bulgarian service. We are monitoring the Bulgarian media. We can see a huge outburst of pro-Russian propaganda there, which is connected with the impact of the church and the impact of the pro-Russian parties, political parties which exist there. And again, what we are doing now, we are trying what we're doing here in Ukraine, we try to take our experience to Bulgaria as well, and uh, it shows that this response is efficient. We also opened several services in Turkey, so we can see lots of efforts uh, done by Russia about the global south, so-called global south. So where they see that their efforts can lead to some outcomes and which uh, spheres they consider to be of top priority, they just refocus some of the resources and allocate their efforts there uh, just to get more profitable conditions for their businesses which they rear in just to decrease the support of Ukraine or the Western countries to support Ukraine. So. Again, we can see those efforts, we register them, and we try to counter them. We can see that others, uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations, are also trying to counter Russian efforts. I would like to add a word. Well, I'm out of time, but still. Yes, it's the matter of paradox that we urge for legal actions, but there are no lawyers among us. So we can see, still, our message is not to, is, 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 our message is just to collect and disseminate knowledge, knowing how it is working. It is also important for us to disseminate, besides all of that, two more messages. Message number one. Everything which is labeled by the link ru.ru is not relevant. In the West, in fact, they don't imagine how much this picture of the world is distorted. If our colleague Lubov Cebulska, who is regularly collecting the pearls and aphorisms of Russian propaganda, she showed the 10-minute video in Brussels, a very nice collection of different expressions and words at the Russian channels. People were just, in the audience, people were just totally killed. They could not even imagine that in the 21st century these words can be heard from the TV, moreover, the state TV channel. So it's important for us, whatever is coming from Russia, it should be, beforehand, it should be perceived as wrong. It shouldn't be just checked. And just to recheck two or three sources, maybe there is such a leak. In fact, it's not productive, and it's so important to disseminate everywhere in the world. The domain name dot ru is not relevant. This is message number one. And number two, well, of course, it's incredibly important. And I, well, it's my historical legacy that since 2002 till 2007, I was observing very closely how the informational troops are formed in Russia. So we can speak about that for a long time, but it, we'd better take a beer for that. So we need to understand that everybody who wanted to save some moral coordinates, they just were excluded from that, uh, from that space 10 to 15 years ago. If someone accidentally left it a month or two ago and acknowledge that they are at the dark side of the power, you cannot believe that. It's impossible. This is a very thorough check of the stuff. They were trained and the selection was
taking place in a very reliable manner during the last 20 years, 100%. So everybody who is in Russia at the higher uh, positions, at the lower positions, their only aim, we, we need to make them know that they cannot just uh, they cannot just be missed. The, uh, and how we can punish them, it is the question for the legal advisors. So our time is out. I would like uh, to have the last statements for our foreign colleagues. Maybe you would like to mention something else about the propaganda from Russia. Well, why are we speaking about the court? As Yuri has mentioned, we don't have lawyers among us, but we are the journalists. And we understand that Russian propaganda has to be countered, but we can't counter just with debunking or busting those myths. My colleagues are debunking thousands of fakes, but the Russian machine of lies produces 10,000. And also we cannot counter Russian propaganda with our own counter propaganda because when the dog is barking we are not just crawling and barking at the dog in any case russian propaganda in their violence and uh, propaganda of hatred it will always be more efficient we cannot do it how the Russians do. Our civilization matrix, our internal matrix, will not allow us to be as efficient in lies and hatred as they are. But we always have a civilized and really only efficient decision. We just need to stop it. When the dog is barking, when the dog is biting, the people do something with that dog. Well, at least they give it to the shelter or for, they have to bring it up. But still, thankfully, we are speaking about Russians, not dogs. So the tribunal is possible here. Okay, thank you. I thank you for this interesting meeting. We have journalists here who are also joining this initiative. So please join. And Yuri, yes, especially for the foreign colleagues, I uh, calculated that among the five presentees in the panel, four are the bearers of Russian surnames, and at least three of us ha were Russian-speaking. This is just the illustration for this face of Ukrainian Nazism, uh, and uh, maybe it would be useful for you in your further work. Thank you. I thank you. Please join such a very important initiative. Everything will be Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes.